Today's session reflects some of the big questions uh, that we tackle in a sophomore program called Transformative Ideas, which I have uh, the pleasure to direct. Uh, in Transformative Ideas, students explore life's big questions of meeting, purpose, and value without the pressure to perform. And we do this through courses uh, that ask questions about the good life, about science, about health, about politics, um, and much, much more. And we also do that through a dorm, a living learning community that encourages students to have vigorous debate and discussion and dialogue um, about questions of significance and to do that in a spirit of intellectual friendship and curiosity. And that's what we faculty are going to model uh, for you uh, today. Um, we will, uh, uh, in this session, you will hear two distinctly different uh, perspectives uh, on what is real from my colleagues, uh, from Maria uh, Gorlatova, who is the Nortel uh, Networks Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering from the Pratt School of Engineering, and also Asta, who is the Professor of Philosophy of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, we will invite questions from the audience after our presentation, and also after a short panel discussion between myself and our two speakers. Uh, and after that, we will uh, then move to the audience question and answer portion of the program. Well, welcome to each of our two speakers. Uh, Asta, let's begin first with you. What is your answer to the question, what is real? So the question for our conversation today is, what is real? I'm going to focus on three questions that have cast some light on that. What exists? What is real? And how we know? Let's start with what exists. Do tables and chairs exist? What about cards? Or is talking of cards just a convenient way of speaking? Perhaps what really exists is just minute particles like quarks and such. Perhaps cats are just particles arranged in a catty manner. A persistent idea in philosophy is to say that what exists it is what our best theory says exists. The theory in question can be a scientific theory, but need not be. It could be astrology. What exists is what our best explanation for something says there is. For instance, if your best explanation for the lightning in the sky is the existence of electricity, electric charge, and so on, then you say electric charge and various things that produce it exist. If your best explanation, on the other hand, posits gods flying around in the sky on winged horses, then you will say gods on winged horses exist. So let's probe your intuition here. I am going to ask you with a show of hands, um, if you could turn your camera on so I could just get a sense um, of where you are with this. You can raise your hand, wave, or um, if you think the things that I mentioned exist. Are you ready? All right. Tables and chairs? Yeah? What about cats? Cats? Yeah. Clouds? Institutions like Duke University, do they exist? Numbers, like the number six. Number six, it's my favorite, favorite number. It's perfect. It's got to exist. You know, I'm from Iceland. Anyone been to Iceland? Elves, you know, you can't, you cannot mess with the elves in Iceland. What do you think? Yeah. Witches, UFOs. God? Yeah, yeah, good. Now, you may say about some of these that they exist, but exist in a sort of funny way, or at least not in the way that trees and cats and chairs exist. Perhaps you want to say that about institutions like Duke. Duke is human created, you might say, unlike cats. You cannot just craft cats out of mud and good intentions. People have tried, hasn't really worked. And what should we say about numbers? It is hard to touch and smell them. Has anyone ever smelled the number six? Okay, so let's talk about being real. What is this thing being real? 
It's a complicated question. And I think to make any headway with it, we should treat it as presupposing a comparison, real as opposed to something else, real versus fake, real versus constructed, real versus illusory. In philosophy, people discuss various other possibilities, such as unreal, ideal, conceptual, abstract, among other things. I will focus on just these three, real as opposed to fake, constructed, and illusory. I know my colleague Maria will talk about virtual and augmented reality. And when we get into our discussion later, we can think about how to approach the status of those things. But let's start with fakes. Real versus fake. When do we care about whether something is fake? We ask, is the $100 bill real or fake? Is the signature on this document that transfers all my money to a Mr. Ponzi real? Is this painting someone is trying to sell you a real Picasso? What do we care about here? I submit that we care about authenticity. But what would that mean in this context? I think it means origin. What makes something real here is whether it was created in the right way. Neither the way it looks nor its function is the issue. The fake does not have the right origin. It also involves deception. It seems to be other than it is and intentionally so. Someone has made it to look like it was created in a different way from how it came into being. Someone has made it look like it has a different origin from what it does have. Let's turn to real versus constructed. What is constructed by us humans may not be masquerading as not made up, so may not include the element of deception that we see with fake. Sometimes everyone knows it is human-made. Think of Duke University. People even get famous and have the thing named after them or a close family member when they create it. However, some of the things that are human-created may seem to be natural, and it takes a lot of intellectual work to uncover its true nature and to debunk common beliefs about it. I think social categories like gender and race are like that. We're now starting to approach the question whether and how we can know that something, what something is or is like. So let us turn to illusions. It's a persistent theme in philosophy to worry whether what seems to be the case really is the case or is merely an illusion. In the Republic, Plato raises, raised the question whether we humans are perceiving things directly and as they really are. In his allegory of the cave, maybe some of you know, we are like prisoners shackled at the bottom of a cave, watching shadows move on a cave wall, mistaking those shadows for real objects. What's the status of what we are perceiving? Is it real, is it real or not? Also, how do we know? Can we know within the experience itself whether it is real? Let's talk about the status of what we are perceiving. Let's look at my gorgeous blue cup here. See, Duke Faculty Advancement, they give you this, this kind of thing. Gorgeous uh, shade of blue too. Okay, I'm going to hold it up. Everyone, if you could stare at this cup. Okay, when you're looking at the cop, what is it that you're perceiving directly? We're all on Zoom. I'm in my lovely office in the Duke Philosophy Department. I'm holding a physical object, a blue cup, nice shade of blue. I'm staring at it. But what are you staring at? Are you staring at the cup? Or are you staring at an image on your computer? Perhaps you're even on your phone? Now you might say, 
Sure, I'm not perceiving the cup directly. I'm holding the cup here still. <laughs> but I'm perceiving it indirectly because the cup caused the image on the screen. The cup is responsible for my experience, you might say. So I'm perceiving the cup even though it's indirect. But think about this. What if my brilliant colleague, Maria, from whom you're going to hear in a second, had simply conjured up something on your screen that looks like my lovely Duke cup. But the image you see wasn't caused by the cup, even though you could not tell. What would you be perceiving then? A blue cup or perhaps mere pixels on a screen that you could not distinguish from a cup? Here, I have a hypothesis. You are perceiving a cup if the experience you are having is caused in the right way. And now you see a connection with the fake. Your experience a cup. If the origin of your experience is the cup, not my clever colleague scientist. But can you tell from within the experience what is causing it? In the meditations, Descartes led us on a journey to figure out if there's anything that we can be certain about. And in one of the meditations, he considers whether one can know whether one is dreaming. Maybe some of you have heard about this dream argument. Yes, these sort of questions did not start with the movie The Matrix. <laughs> Think about your own dreaming. Can you tell from within the dream that it is a dream? Does your dream come with a little sticker in the corner that says, you are dreaming now? Or is it only after you wake up that you know you were just dreaming? That is what Descartes thought. We're now approaching the topics my colleague Maria will tell us about, virtual reality and augmented reality. Then in the discussion after, we can think about how such things are like Descartes' dreams, or fake Picassos. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much, Asta. And one thing I know that's real is that was a really great start to this conversation. And now over uh, to you, Maria, same question. What is real? Absolutely delighted to be here. It is such a pleasure to be participating in this conversation as I deal with the question of uh, what it's like to create alternative realities on a day-to-day -day basis, and yet the uh, Asta is raising lots of uh, questions that I have never truly considered. So my, um, my group works on creating virtual and augmented reality. And um, it does not solve the questions that Asta has raised. Uh, rather, it raises uh, a lot of additional questions that are within this domain. So let me tell you briefly about what uh, virtual and augmented reality truly are. Um, they are often mentioned, uh, they often mentioned the together, but they really are quite different. Virtual reality is meant to place a user in the fully virtual world. A user wears a headset that blocks the view of uh, of the world that, that is in front of the user. So the headset is intended to have you not perceive uh, what, what, what is actually around you. And this allows you to be placed in a world that is completely different from yours. The virtual reality is quite uh, um, is commercially viable at this point. Uh, a lot of uh, virtual reality applications exist, and uh, if we were to put virtual and augmented reality on a map of uh, how far in the future are they from everyday use, uh, virtual reality would be closer. Augmented reality, you also wear a headset or you can use a phone to generate an augmented reality experience. But the principle of it is quite different in that we uh, add virtual content to the world that is around us. So think of a Pokemon Go, for instance, that you build a Pokemon inside the space that is, is around you. So while you also wear a headset, the principle of headset operation is very different, that uh, you do not block the outside view, but rather you use a see-through headset and a small display that adds virtual content uh, to your view of the real world. And absolutely love uh, Asta's use of the word illusion. That That is the word that we use every day. Uh, both virtual and augmented reality is strive to create a perfect illusion. We do strive to create a virtual experience that is indistinguishable from real. 
but um, we are not quite there yet. Uh, you can tell that you are in the virtual world. You can tell that the object is not real. You cannot tell if you're not within a dream, but you can absolutely say that this is not reality. There are um, there are there are signs that pixel quality is not quite there for virtual reality. The lights and shades and uh, virtual combustibility are not quite there for augmented reality. But nonetheless, the experiences are already very engaging. They have uh, lots of uses and. Uh, it is absolutely clear that they will become become better and better and closer to be able to fool your senses uh, uh, very uh, uh, very shortly. So virtual reality is really about putting you in context of an entirely different reality. Again, you know, the view of the world around you is completely blocked, and this allows us to create a an environment around you that is just entirely different from yours. And this is, uh, I want to stress that this is not like the movie, that uh, in the movie, someone else controls what you see. And in virtual reality, you walk around, you see, um, you explore what you like, you look at what you like, you move your body uh, in multiple directions as, as you would like. You cannot touch objects, but the way that you look at them and the sounds they make really is very realistic. So one thing that this allows you to do is to go to a reality that is distant or unreachable. You can go to a museum that is uh, far away from you. You can explore the inside of the International Space Station. You can see what it's like on top of Mount Everest or on the North and South Pole. And uh, this um, this this uh, this has a potential of uh, really enriching your life that you are able to get access to realities that you really cannot. Another use of this uh, idea of a completely of a reality that's not reachable to you is use of virtual reality in training. That uh, we are able to put uh, people in environments that they cannot see on a day-to-day -day basis. So for instance, we are able to create certain medical experiences or uh, first responder situations that are just do not happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So this allows us to train people in reality is that they will be exposed to in the future, but do not have access on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another use of this idea of creating an entirely different reality for somebody is that you are able to experience a reality of someone else. And uh, the, really, the easiest use case for this is um, modeling perception disorders. That if we put you in a virtual reality headset, we can very readily create for you an experience of someone who has uh, uh, peripheral vision loss or central vision loss or a sensory processing disorder that um, changes how you process speech. This is very easy to create. They are, they are very radio showcases, and uh, they're transformative for for people who have not seen those disorders up close. It's, uh, it's very insightful to, to get a sense of what they really are like. More out there, you, uh, we're not restricted to seeing the worlds of humans. We're not restricted to seeing human reality. We can use virtual reality to see the world of wildlife, for instance, that uh, um, there's a showcase that uh, allows you to explore the world as a turtle would and uh, see what uh, what turtle's reality is like. And uh, th these experiences are, they, they have been showcased to improve empathy, that you truly are immersed in someone else's world. And uh, this, uh, this enriches your understanding of what their reality is like. Um, in addition to this, uh, where virtual reality shines already and has the potential to shine further is its use in therapy. That we can put you in a reality that is relaxing for you, or we can put you in a reality that uh, conversely exposes you to the stimuli that um, that that we we do not want you exposed in the real world. This is where use of virtual reality for treatment of uh, post traumatic stress disorder is is very very interesting. That uh, the um, from this virtual reality you get the physiological reaction that you would get from the real reality, and uh, this is what you can work with, and this is what you can get used to. Um, what what I'm personally finding absolutely fascinating is that uh, virtual reality has enormous potential in pain management. It has been demonstrated to uh, be very helpful in treatment of, uh, in support of treatment of very painful procedures in uh, children and adults alike. 
And uh, this has the potential of uh, reducing opioid consumption in for, for these procedures. And um, it has been demonstrated that uh, virtual reality truly helps um, for the way that the users experience pain and the way that their brain responds to, to pain. If they're placed in this alternative reality, all of that changes. And uh, the benefits and the applications for that are truly enormous. Uh, so this is this is virtual reality experiencing something that's entirely entirely different from where you are right now um, in in multiple ways. Augmented reality uh, again, you also wear a headset, but the goals are very different. Um, augmented reality is about seeing the, the invisible where you are. So it is about bringing out other layers of uh, meaning or knowledge or other layers of reality in the reality that you're in. Mm. So when, uh, one example of this is just showing information. Um, what is, uh, so let's say that we are, you, we are using a mobile phone and we are painting it towards the sky and uh, the mobile phone shows us with the constellations in the sky. This app exists, it's, it's really it's really useful, it's really cool, but uh, you, um, this information, it's there. You, you can look it up in a book, supposedly, but seeing it right there where, where it belongs, uh, it, it's, uh, interesting and informative. And there are many professional uses of this type of ability to see the invisible, that you are able to see what is inside a wall that, uh, that is otherwise uh, just a wall to you, but uh, with augmented reality, you can see uh, the, uh, well, the areas within it that you need to avoid the target. Um, uh, or in cabling, if uh, you have cables that all look alike, uh, augmented reality can show you where, where to put them. And it's very interesting and useful and has been shown to be very useful. Uh, my group works on surgical applications of this capability of demonstrating the invisible, that uh, if we take a preoperative scan of the patient and we uh, generate for the surgeon the view of uh, that scan in, in the area where they'd like to target, this, uh, this, this is useful and helpful and has been demonstrated to be helpful across uh, a wide range of conditions. Uh, but in terms of uh, this, this is just one example of the invisible, invisible sensory data that, uh, that you cannot see without augmented reality. But there are many other types of invisible as well. Uh, augmented reality can be uh, used to visualize what has been in space or what will be or what others perceive space as. So for instance, if you are standing in a city corner, an augmented reality app can show you what uh, buildings around you used to look like, or it can show you the um, landscape, the cityscape uh, that uh, will come into existence as the new buildings are put together. Or it can show you, uh, it can show, it can translate for you signs to, uh, to different language. So there's multiple layers of meaning. They, um, uh, they, they find applications across different domains in art, in history, in paleontology, uh, visualizing what has been, will be, could be a, a reality of others, reality of uh, the past. Uh, so in addition to this, so I mentioned that um, we, we are not quite able to, so the, the augmented reality uh, it's not quite the reality. You you see that it's not real. When you there there are hints. Uh, your perception is not quite uh, fooled by it. But there's there's one interesting direction that uh, has been emerging that uh, will uh, will become more and more technologically feasible as we as we go along. And that also has um, very interesting inter interplay with reality. That we we do not just have to add material to your reality. We can also erase material. We can uh, take a space that's cluttered and uh, remove the objects, uh, paint them over, make, make the room look clear when it's uh, when it's uh, messy. So uh, one of the examples on the screen is uh, um, um, the vision that we have of uh, blocking objects that are distracting for you with holograms so that you can able well and you can focus better. And another example that you see on the screen here is a showcase in the top uh, augmented reality conference that showed how in real life, in real time, a car can be replaced with this uh, fairy tale object. So overall, this is uh, uh, there are many different ways that realities could be changed by these uh, types of technologies. 
If you are ever interested in demonstrations, uh, please look me up. We are in Wilkinson building close to the chapel. And uh, I would be absolutely thrilled to show you some demos and to talk to you about the possibilities and applications. Thanks, Maria, uh, so much for uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, and as you see, I also uh, have a, a very real uh, uh, Duke mug, although I think a very classic uh, version of the Duke logo. Uh, and now I get the great pleasure uh, to have a, a conversation with you all about, I think, some of the really profound implications of your work. And I want to start uh, by uh, relating, relaying an experience of my own that I thought was quite profound. I mean, so I'm a millennial, uh, high school class of 2000, uh, graduated college in 2004. I encountered Facebook for the first time uh, in 2005, back when uh, Facebook was connected to colleges and you had to be like a college student uh, to join Facebook. I remember uh, uh, a train ride uh, from Cambridge uh, to London in 2007 or 2008. I think it was 2008. My wife and I were riding on, on a train and uh, she worked for the, uh, uh, the investment office at Cambridge and she had a BlackBerry. And I remember seeing her check her email on the BlackBerry and it was so, so cool. Uh, so like previous generations, we millennials, uh, did not grow up in a pervasive digital world. Uh, for Gen Zs, right, those people that are born in, in the late 90s, 2000s, uh, uh, it's very different. And I remember having a conversation with a student a few years uh, before uh, COVID, uh, and we were sitting in Perkins Cafe. Uh, we were drinking coffee. And and as we were chatting, she she had her phone on her table. She pointed to her phone, and she said, Professor, she said, my identity is here. It's here on my phone, by which she meant my most fundamental reality, what's most important about me, how I present myself to others, how others see and come to know my identity. It's on this physical space that you and I are, are, are occupying right here in, in Perkins Cafe, but, but rather it's, it's in this digital world, this digital space. And this struck me as uh, extremely self-aware, first of all, uh, for this student. And also second, as extremely profound and far-reaching uh, in its implications. And, and Maria had asked, uh, I wonder if you could help us think about the implications of this generational shift uh, from the perspective of your own work. And, and maybe Maria, we'll start with you. Uh, from your uh, work on virtual and augmented reality, you've taken us through a lot of different ways uh, that uh, that technologies uh, can shape us from uh, you know uh, making my room appear clean uh, to uh, you know doing better surgery. Uh, and I just wonder, what are one or two of the most significant uh, ways uh, that uh, the shift in interaction with technology uh, among uh, the younger generations uh, uh, will shape those generations uh, to see and engage the world more differently uh, than people from my generation and older? Uh, it's an exciting question, Jed. Uh, I have learned... I have a three-year-old and uh, it's very interesting how he takes technology absolutely for granted. And it's just natural for him that uh, there is a map in the car that knows exactly where he is and that uh, can tell him where to go. When I was his age, a map had to be <laughs> printed out and you didn't know where you were and you could make mistakes. <laughs> but for him, it just absolutely, it's, it's at his fingertips and he's born with this. So as, as a three-year-old, he is he just engages with the world completely differently. Um, I think that uh, we, so we, we will definitely see lots of that, that uh, what uh, the awareness of um, what is around you and the, the awareness of these different levels of reality can truly be um, uh, brought to people at, at a different level. And we will see more and more of that, that uh, one thing is uh, knowing where you, um, where you are in physical space, and another one is having this understanding, immediate understanding, immediate vision of what the space used to be like, for instance. Or um, there, there's some interesting, um, in general, where the technology is headed is towards uh, better understanding of ourselves as well. That uh, right now we, the technology can tell him that we are somewhere and um, soon enough it will help him to uh, understand his own emotional state for instance or he is uh, uh why why he's feeling a certain way so that's definitely uh, 
Uh, that's my perception oriented uh, uh, take on this question. And I don't know what Asta's thoughts are. Well, thanks so much. And that actually where you brought us to this idea of sort of self-identification actually, I think, uh, leads us quite nicely into some of Asta's work. Because Asta, in your presentation, you so very nicely sort of gave us these sort of three categories, you know, the real is fake, uh, the real versus constructed, and then the illusions. Uh, and, and you know, you're, you're, you've written a very important book uh, on, on thinking about uh, identity uh, and categories of thinking about identity. And, and, and in particular, I think that's touching on the second category, you know, the things that are constructed, the Duke uh, and, and the gender and the race. And, and I wonder, um, based on uh, your work on uh, social categories, if you could help us process uh, these uh, changes in our engagement with the technology as they relate to our self-identities. Yeah, thank you. That's um, interesting. So the, <clears throat> I, I tend to think of identity like this, that we all have various features and only some of them have social meaning in the context that we travel. And they may, those features that have social meaning that matter socially may not be the ones we identify with. So for instance, I might identify with being a fan of a, a soccer club in Iceland, but like the, the context I travel in now, that's not socially significant at all. It doesn't register at all. And there are certain features of us that are sort of persistently socially significant in the in the context we travel so gender and race tend to be um sometimes class or uh various other in certain countries um the, the way you speak uh, indicates your class or where you come from or, and, and it helps so uh, but you might have may not identify very strongly with some of those features even though they're important for your social um context. Um, so what is interesting about the development of the sort of uh, the online identity is that, um, I mean, it's always the case that what you identify with has to be socially available to you. You cannot identify with something that isn't socially available. Um, but it's much more fluid in the real world. Whereas in the digital world, there are these categories that have been set up by Facebook or Instagram or, or all these dating apps or whatever it is, you have to sort of, you know, press a button or click on a, on a certain thing to indicate where you situate yourself within that digital social space. We're always situating ourselves in our normal embodied social space, right? We indicate by the way we dress, by the way we carry ourselves, the way we talk, all kinds of things. We indicate how we want other people to treat us and how they want us to, you know, how how you how we want other people to engage with us. But in the digital space, the categories are quite they're discrete categories, you know, you have to sort of, so for instance, if um, just talking about gender, you, you, you know, Facebook at some point had like two genders and then it had, you know, a third and now there's like a sea of them and you could choose one of these things. Um, but that, that it, you place yourself in these sort of quite fixed categories for the purposes of the social engagement. And that, of course, has effect on how you start thinking of yourself. And if you spent a lot of time on social media, then the way, the role you play on social media is going to influence the way you um, identify in other contexts. Um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting moment we're living in. No, that's fascinating, Asta, and even the way that uh, technology uh, and, uh, can be and social media can be uh, designed uh, to uh, impact us uh, in certain ways. So I was on a panel last week with Chris Bale, uh, who's a, um, a sociologist who works on social media and polarization. And you know, one thing that he pointed out was having the like button, adding the like button uh, to Facebook, for instance. Uh, incentivized us in some ways to, uh, you know, to, to 
contributed to polarization by incentivizing us to really uh, think about how others uh, see us and want that attention. So we tend to do say more extreme things in order to get uh, that attention and get those hits and get that dopamine. Uh, so what you say is is important. Um, I'm going to turn now from ontology, and that's a fancy word. I'm I'm, I'm in the classics department, but I also have appointments in philosophy and uh, as well as political science. And so sometimes I use fancy words like ontology, but that's just you know the the the, the study of of reality of what is, which is what we've been talking about. Well, I want to turn from uh, ontology to ethics now. Uh, or maybe better, the relationship between ontology and ethics. Uh, Maria, in a, in a really fascinating article, uh, you uh, on augmented reality, um, you suggest that augmented reality, so this kind of reality that uh, we're able to uh, to, to filter uh, the way and impose uh, on the way we see the world rather than completely shaping, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, seeing something new like in virtual reality, so this augmented reality. Um, you say augmented reality can assist us towards personal change by helping us develop better habits. So, for instance, uh, augmented reality may blur unhealthy food choices uh, on the menu. Uh, or, for example, uh, I could wear glasses, and when I'm going through Trader Joe's in a checkout line, those little dark chocolate peanut butter cups that sometimes fall into my basket on the way out, I, you know, th those get blurred out, uh, and so they no longer fall into my basket. Uh, well, in writings on happiness uh, from Aristotle all the way to like popular podcaster Gretchen Rubin, who's one of my wife's favorite, favorite podcasters, uh, free choice is the key to ethics. Uh, in, in developing good habits and living a happy, uh, valuable life. And, and on one very popular uh, level of free choice, that choice is only free if you could have chosen otherwise. So does augmented reality take away our choice and risk making uh, decisions like how, what I eat uh, ethically insignificant? Um, that, that is an excellent question, Judd. So um, first and foremost, um, uh, this is something that... Uh, Folks who work on human technology interaction have given a lot of thoughts that uh, we absolutely must uh, um, let human make the final decision. So a human absolutely always should have this option of snapping back to reality, for instance, that uh, a human should always be in control and the human should make uh, uh, the choice uh, at the very start, the choice of uh, continuing to engage with an augmented reality experience or starting to engage with it is always with a human. And uh, if uh, if it ever is not, then we are truly living in the matrix that uh, the, the, the choice must stay with you. Um, the, um, the question of uh, how that factors with uh, what we do habitually uh, is, is a very interesting one. That we see um, in this context, augmented reality as a... Uh, is, is a type of digital mentor or coach that you the coach uh, suggests what you should do the you you engage the services of the coach but the coach does tell you what to do uh, same as uh, I I work with my PhD students they've chosen to work with me but I do tell them what to do I do they they can stop working with me at any point but the, in at any given moment in time uh, I I give them strong suggestions or I coach them or I I cajole them. I uh, I use my powers of the coach to guide them towards what we have we jointly have agreed on is their goal. So we definitely see uh, augmented reality and other related technology in this type of mentor coach role, where the final decision of whether to continue engaging is always with um, is always with, with the person. Um, for the specifics of uh, in the moment choices, like uh, looking at the chocolate bar, this is where. Um, this is largely unexplored, but we had uh, very interesting discussions with um, people who, with clinical psychologists on this and with uh, behavioral scientists. And ultimately, you were, uh, it comes down to questions of um, uh, that arise in cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, or in emotional regulation, that uh, you you do have, although your reality is, is given to you, where you deploy attention in that reality is your choice. And how you interpret that reality is your choice as well. So if uh, if you go to a supermarket and you avoid those chocolate bars, that's that's your choice. Or if you choose to think about your goals rather than your immediate pleasure, uh, perhaps your goals are your immediate pleasure, and that's perfectly valid too. So this is where we, we really see uh, 
a great idea in this case working on that level uh, as giving you perhaps uh, working in the in the same way as your you learning to deploy your attention or you learning to make those choices or learning to cognitively reassess the situation. Just that technology has a role in helping you do that better than you choose to you. But that, that is an excellent question and it touches upon so many uh, deep and important and uh, concepts that we absolutely, we as technologists must absolutely get right for this to not become a nightmare. Thanks, Maria. Uh, I'm going to ask a version of this to, to Asta, and then we'll uh, turn it over to you, uh, the audience. And I, so Asta, one of the things about philosophers, uh, for those of you who didn't major in philosophy, uh, you know, a, a book is, a philosophers love to argue. And so you can always tell their book has made an impact by the strength of its critics. And, uh, and, and then you get to respond to your critics. Uh, and in a wonderful essay, uh, Asta, when you respond to your critics, uh, you say the following about social categories, the social categories we live by. So I'm going to quote uh, from uh, the response to your critics. Uh, it is about other people to some extent, but mostly about the social setting you find yourself in, uh, with its values, norms, practices, and material conditions. Those are the things that determine what is possible for you to be, uh, and other individuals in a group assign you roles in accordance with that. They are the foot soldiers who enforce the values of the social setting you find yourself in. The foot soldiers who enforce the ideology, if you will. And I wonder if your theory renders the question I just asked Maria as missing the point. Perhaps the focus shouldn't be on what the individual should do, an individual choice, which is how I frame the question to Maria, but rather maybe our attention should be on how we can shape the systems to enable us to make better choices, better systems, better societal settings, better choices. Uh, in this case, being unable to choose otherwise or having your choices at least seriously constrained is just part of social reality. So let's just uh, focus on having better systems to have a better reality. Well, absolutely. Um, but, you know, a lot of intellectual work uh, is needed to understand um, where you can make uh, changes. So you need to have a, a good account of the way social reality operates so that you can direct your attempts at changing. For instance, if you think certain aspects of social reality are, are unjust, um, then you need an accurate picture of that injustice so you can focus your attention for change. And sometimes you think aspects of social reality are not unjust, and that, but you want to think about what the justification for that arrangement is. And it's always good to do that, right? The, um, but, you know, we are, you know, Otto Neurath, he has this um, sort of metaphor that uh, we as theorists, but also as people, um, we are in the middle of an ocean on a boat. And so any change that we're trying to enact is going to be like when we're trying to fix our boat in the middle of the sea. We're never going to be able to pull it, pull it up to dock and fix it, you know, on dry land. We have to be doing things piecemeal and take everything into account. The So... I mean, one thing that's so interesting about the augmented and virtual reality is that part of when we are thinking about an authentic experience, uh, we want an experience that, that is not curated by someone. We want an experience that we, that isn't about going to Disney World or Disneyland or or um, a theme park, but actually to have an encounter that is ours. And maybe it's a fantasy because uh, the way we even frame what experience we're having has to rely on the language and the concepts we have available to us to describe that experience. So for instance, if I walk into the woods and I want to have a an experience with a beautiful tree, um, even the way I make sense of that is, has if, if I think of that as an awe-inspiring experience some people talk about communion with uh, with you know a spiritual communion um to make sense of that you need language and concept and all of that is social um so there's no 
unmediated experience in that sense. It's always going to be mediated by something social. But there's still a difference between that and then the curated experience. Um, and the the sort of the choices that you have in the curated experience are all set for you. Thank you. Well, let's get into the audience questions. And and I have the first question that was asked is from Dana and um and a series of questions, but uh maybe I started just thinking with with you and 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 I can see in some ways that the metaphor you gave about sort of a, a ship as sort of in the ocean but never on a shore might speak to this a little bit, but but maybe to put it straightforward, uh she, part of her question, she says, Do any absolutes of reality exist for all? Uh exist um all around. Uh um, ex I'm sorry, do any absolutes of reality that exist for all exist within or around uh, these uh, these different uh, perceptions? Um, so uh, so what do you think? Well, I would I would invite um, the question, was it Dana um, to uh, it's helpful to know what um, what's behind the question. So when a when I approached the question, what's real, I thought, look, it's a big question. It could go in lots of different directions to know what the um, what the alternative is and what the opposition is. So I think when we ask about absolutes, it's, it's good to think about what is what would, would be the opposition. And, and often people are thinking like absolute versus relative. Um, or something like that. And there's definitely certain things, you know, there are things that are not relative, right? Um, but so I think it would be good to know sort of what the alternate would be for that, for a particular context. Um, the, you know, Descartes thought, talking about him in the meditations, he thought that there was one thing he could be sure of, and that was that he was thinking. Um, and even if the evil demon that he imagines uh, could trick him, he couldn't trick him into doubting that he was doubting, that there was something certain, right? And so if, if by absolute is something certain, then, you know, all of you who are here with us, um, are maybe doubting what we are saying, right? But they can't, the evil demon can't take that away from you, right? Yep. So, so sometimes what people want is something epistemic, something like certainty. And sometimes they want something that's about, um, that doesn't change with context. Thank you. Uh, well, we have another question, and uh, this question is, uh, is from Mohan. Uh, and uh, this question um, I'm going to direct uh, to Maria. Uh, and it's a really interesting question. Uh, can something be real and unreal at the same time? Can something be real or unreal at the same time? Yeah, that that is a, that is a fascinating question indeed. Since I guess um, virtual reality tackles that uh, head on that it's not real, uh, but it's real as well uh, because it is virtual, but it's also the reality. Um, that 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 is a fascinating question. I think. Uh, <clears throat> Um, we can definitely, uh, we can definitely, we can definitely fool your senses into believing something that, uh, something that is not real actually is real. So my, I'm going to go with yes on this one, but something can be unreal and real at the same time. And, uh, yeah, well, definitely, and, uh, definitely, uh, um, people will experience the same reality in different ways. So yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm yes on this one. Do you agree, Asta? You know, um, one of the things that one learns as a, a baby philosopher is like something can't be both P and not P at the same time, right? Something can't be both real and unreal at the same time in the same sense. But in different senses, sure, sure. And that's often the paradox. And, par and often what you do as a philosopher is to say, it seems that it's both real and unreal at the same time, the same thing, but 
appearances are deceiving. And it turns out that we use real in one sense and it's real. And then we use unreal in a different sense and it pertains to the object at the same time. And that's fine. Donald McGuinness uh, asks a really interesting question. I mean, we've already heard Plato being referenced and uh, in, in, at the end of Plato's Republic, there's this myth of Ur, and, and, and Cicero, who read Plato, has something called the Dream of Scipio, uh, where, where instead of having somebody re resurrect from the dead and goes to the afterlife, as in Plato, uh, you have somebody dream uh, of meeting somebody, his, his grandfather in the afterlife, who's passed away. And, and, so, and so, you know, this is a work that was written, uh, you know, in about 50 BCE. Uh, so... So yeah, we've been dealing with these sorts of questions in dream and human consciousness for thousands of years. And so how do dreams fit in uh, to this uh, discussion? Um, Maria, you want to start first in the next? Yeah, one? I think that that's an excellent question. And there, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot to be studied about dreams and there's a lot to be said about dreams. But uh, one of the key differences is that uh, Dreams we do not control, and uh, technical uh, technical mediated experiences we do. So we can uh, others can control them for us, or we can control them ourselves. And um, there there is a big uh, there is a big difference there. Uh, and um, while um, we can definitely borrow a lot from study of dreams, um, technology does raise questions that are fundamental. From my perspective, technology raises questions that are fundamentally different since you do uh, control it. Thanks. Esther. Yeah, dreams are fascinating. You know, talking about Descartes, he thought that there were certain, I mean, so if we ask what can we learn from dreams and are dreams something that we can rely on? And, and obviously, well, most people think you can't, um, except if you think um, Freud and psychoanalysis has things to offer, then you might come to realize certain things about yourself through dreaming, partly because there are certain involuntary things and we all have defense mechanisms. And in dreams, we don't have control over those. And so some aspects of truth of, about ourselves can come into, uh, come into light. Um, and, and dreaming when you're sleeping and also when you're daydreaming, lucid dreams, uh, as, as Larry uh, Burke says, I suppose, uh, pertains to the, the same types of considerations. Would you say, Asta? Well, um, we you have more control over the lucid dreams. Uh, so, off, I mean, some lucid dreams are like um, role playing with yourself, right? You're thinking of, okay, how am I going to do this or whatever. Um, the, I mean, they're interesting. The lucid dreams where that when you're not controlling it, that those are interesting kinds of cases. Yeah, you know, that's that's, and I like what you say about. The role playing, and Maria, I'm gonna uh, get you in here in a second. I mean, one of the things what what I do in in my classes, uh, I teach a class called The Good Life: Religion, Philosophy, and Life's Ultimate Concerns with some friends in the philosophy department, and uh, and and uh, and some other uh, uh, colleagues across the university. And, and one of the things I try to get we try to get our students to do is to uh, to play with ideas, uh, to be able to awaken the imagination. Uh, and, and role play, dialogue is part of this, right? So one of the assignments for this class is the students are going to be playing and performing a dialogue uh, between uh, major figures in these traditions, like a John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism meets, you know, St. Paul and Christianity, uh, you know, uh, meets the Buddha and, and having and, and playing this role playing conversation to engage the imagination for different ways in which life could be. Uh, Maria, virtual reality, augmented reality, might that have a role to play in this imaginative role playing of, of, you know, I mean, you could be so worried about maybe this manipulating you, this kind of technology or taking agency away, but might be able to expand our agency. Yeah, absolutely. One, one very interesting thing about uh, mental imagery, uh, such as, uh, such as you would have in these imaginary dialogues or in role playing or in other types of experiences is that First of all, people have different abilities to create mental imagery, and some people are significantly worse at it than others. So this is one rule where technology can uh, can truly help um, some people. Uh, the other part is that uh, mental imagery dissipates very quickly, um, and it, with, without uh, conscious control, it uh, dissipates uh, 
very very soon and it uh, also it uh, affects uh, it's cognitively taxing so it's uh, uh, it it uh, interferes with our abilities to do other things so this interplay of uh, purposeful purposeful mental imagery and uh, role of technology that that's a fascinating area in and of itself uh, i am certain that we will be able to create uh, truly enriching important experiences in this specific way if uh, if we uh, jointly harness the power of mental imagery of the person and add technology to help in it thank you well i don't know about the audience but um i have had a really good time and i'm i'm quite certain of that and i've learned quite a lot so i uh, thank you both